news. It's about an albatross, and her name is Wisdom. Wisdom is special for a number of different reasons. First, she's the oldest known wild bird. She's at least 70, since scientists have been tracking her since the 1950s. Second, she just hatched an egg, actually, this spring at 70 years old. Pretty impressive stuff for a, for a septuagenarian. Third, she has gotten help incubating eggs and raising chicks from the same male for a number of years, her mate Akeakamai, which is actually Hawaiian for lover of wisdom, which makes sense. So they're pretty clearly a good team. But wisdom and Akeakamai aren't just in it for the kids. They're very attached to one another. And to give you an example of that, I'm gonna show you a video of a different pair of albatrosses, same species though. And these albatrosses are performing their mating dance together. Let's watch a little bit. Okay, so it goes on for a little while longer, just like that. There's a lot going on in this video. One thing that stands out to me is that, well, they're obviously very happy to see each other, right? They also have this complex routine that requires coordination, a sort of call and response. And it requires the use of multiple communication channels like sound and body movement. And importantly, these two will continue to reunite and do their dance with each other and no one else for year after year. So these birds are displaying several features of what biologists think of as monogamy. You may have heard the idea of animals mating for life or in humans, the idea of a soulmate. And monogamy is related to those ideas, but it's not quite the same. It's actually a pretty complicated concept, monogamy, because there are a bunch of traits that go into it and they tend to go together, but not always. So part of it is what we call uh, pair living, which is exactly what it sounds like. Mating pairs live and associate with each other, instead of living on their own or in larger social groups. Another part is being pair bonded, which is the behavioral aspect of monogamy. Pair bonded animals are clearly attached to one another. They're upset when separated, they're really happy when reunited, and they're more interested in each other than any other animals around. The albatross dance is a really great example of this, right? There's the element of sexual or genetic monogamy, which just means that the pair produce offspring only with each other and uh, no one else. And finally, there's the element of biparental care. Most of the time, monogamous species mate together, but they also raise offspring together. Wisdom and Akeakamai, for instance, are gonna cooperate to hatch the egg and feed their chick, rather than say, just leaving it all to mom. And all these features fall under the sort of umbrella of monogamy. And while not all monogamous species have all of these features together, you can think of them as a bunch of sort of overlapping circles in nature. But no matter how you define it, monogamy isn't something you always see in nature. In fact, depending on the kind of animal, it can be pretty rare. So in birds, about 90% of species are socially monogamous. It's really common. In mammals, on the other hand, only 5% of species are monogamous. Really, what this means is that monogamy needs to be explained, not assumed. And so we have really a classic problem for biologists here, right? Explaining why animals behave so differently. This is the kind of stuff that we get really excited about and interested in. And I specialize in addressing that question in the context of physiology, the brain, and evolution. What this means is I'm asking, what's going on under the skin that makes species behave differently from one another? Well, that's a super big question and one that for sure has a bunch of different answers. But there's one part of biology that plays a really important role, and that's the collection of hormonal systems within animal bodies. Hormones are simply chemical messengers within the body that get released from one specific place, a gland, and then they travel everywhere else through the bloodstream. Because hormones go everywhere, they're kind of like broadcast TV. They're good at conveying a message across distant places. Therefore, animals use them to coordinate a bunch of really complicated and important activities, like deciding when and what to eat, 
when to grow bigger and when to stay the same size, when to fight or when to run. You might have seen a diagram like this one on the left here when you were in health class, for instance. And that's because hormones also regulate the process of puberty, changing from a juvenile to an adult. But it's not like hormones are something that's unique to humans. In fact, while you can probably think of a thousand differences between us and fish, one thing we have in common is most of our hormonal systems. And that's what's depicted in the figure on the right there, right? We have a lot of the same systems and sort of in similar places in the body. What this means is that studying hormones in different species can tell us something really interesting about how different behaviors could have evolved. And so one hormone that scientists have really spent a lot of time focusing on for behavior is called oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced in the brain of all mammals. But remember, it then travels everywhere through the bloodstream. And it's really important for mothers when they need to give birth and then later nurse their offspring. What's really cool is it appears the hormone might also be involved in maternal social bonding, and maybe in some cases, even the bond between mating partners. So scientists first developed these ideas about oxytocin from studying different species of voles, which are these small rodents here. They kind of look like mice, but they have smaller ears and smaller tails. And it turns out that some vole species form pair bonds and raise their young together, uh, like the, the voles there on the left. Others don't, like the one on the right. So scientists wondered whether this difference could be explained by oxytocin working differently in the two species. And so they did a couple of different things. First, they looked at the brains of these voles, and they found out that oxytocin goes to different parts of the brain in pair bonding voles, which are you know, shown by that green box here, compared to the non-pair bonding voles, which are in the orange box there. You can probably see the differences yourself just from looking at the figure. The, the areas that are dark in these brain regions are are really different for the two kinds of voles. And then what's even cooler is that they could make non-monogamous voles behave more like monogamous ones by adding receptors for oxytocin in a key region of their brains. So this figure that I stuck on top of it, that's what's being shown at the bottom there. This AAV treatment, they call it, which just adds oxytocin receptors. It made non-monogamous vole brains look like monogamous vole brains. And furthermore, they behaved more like them to boot. So these are really exciting findings because they really strongly suggest that oxytocin is key to uh, understanding why some animals are monogamous and some animals aren't. And today there is a popular perception that oxytocin is a love or a cuddle hormone. Search oxytocin on Google and that's what a lot of what you'll find, right? People will say it's a magic love potion or the glue that binds people together in close loving relationships. There's even been some research suggesting that the bond between say dogs and their owners is due to oxytocin that increases in both of their brains when they say, look into each other's eyes or when humans pet their dogs, things like that. Okay, well, understanding rodents is great, but what about primates? If we wanna understand ourselves, for instance, it might be a good idea to look at animals more closely related to us. So let's take primates. Within the primate order, there's a ton of diversity in social systems. All the groups you see in red here on the figure at right have some elements of monogamy, even if not all of them. But again, what's cool is that all primates share the same raw ingredients, the same hormonal ingredients, the same basic physiological systems. Why might they behave so differently? Well, one common and true answer is that primates have evolved to live very different lives, right? Some primates can grow to be pretty big, whereas others stay super small. Take Shaq in this mouse lemur here, for instance. Both primates. Primates evolve to eat different things and live in different habitats, and so on. So if we really want to compare apples to apples and be able to isolate specific hormonal factors that explain monogamy, we'd really like a natural experiment. An ideal one would be a situation where, say, closely related primates, species in the same genus, have different mating systems, some monogamous, some not. That's where lemurs come in. It just so happens that the Duke Lemur Center is a really great, ideal place to carry out research on the biology of monogamy, thanks to all the amazing lemur species that are housed there. So lemurs are primates, like us, but they're all native to Madagascar, this island here off the coast of Africa. Since lemurs arrived on the island tens of millions of years ago, 
they have spread out and adapted to very different environments, which has led them to develop a wide range of appearances and behaviors. So specifically, let's talk about the genus Eulemur. It's a genus of a dozen species that live across Madagascar, and they possess a remarkable diversity of mating systems. Some are not monogamous, like the blue-eyed black lemurs and the black lemurs that I pointed out here, but others do form pair bonds, like the mongoose lemurs with the gray heads there, or the red-bellied lemurs with the whites around their eyes. These are both monogamous species. And this sort of natural experiment is one of the reasons lemurs are so cool. In fact, they are the only example in the whole primate order where closely related species show these different social and mating systems. So here's what the genus looks like when showing their evolutionary relationships to one another. You know, they diverged anywhere from um, four million years ago to less than a million years ago. And that is a long time, but in the context of evolution, it really isn't. That means they're all pretty close cousins to one another. And so all the animals I'm gonna talk about today lived at the Duke Lemur Center. The green species are monogamous, and we compared them to the orange species in our studies, the ones that are non-monogamous. So in a lot of ways, our studies are about discovery. Lemurs are endangered, and we know relatively little about their biology. That means there are so many questions we could ask, but we focused on two. Number one, does oxytocin go to different places in the brain in different lemur species? Number two, does briefly blocking oxytocin change lemur social behavior in a predictable way? So for the first question, to figure out where oxytocin is going in the brains of lemurs, we had to look inside their brains, of course. And I wanna emphasize that to do this, we used stored frozen tissue from the Duke Lemur Center from animals that had died of natural causes. So that means that no animals were hurt for this study at all. And we used these stored uh, frozen brain samples to slice the brains into really, really thin slices, less than the thickness of human hair, into many, many thousands of microscope slides so we could get a really precise look at different areas of the brain. So on the left, that's what a slice looks like, still frozen, when it's just been put on a microscope slide. On the right is part of our team in the lab uh, before COVID times, as you might have guessed from the lack of masks. So, once we had the slices, we used a technique to tag the locations of oxytocin receptors. And then we took pictures of these brain slices with the tags to compare across brain regions and species. Here on the left is an example of what the brain of a monogamous red-bellied lemur looks like, going from the front of the brain to the back. Dark areas mean there are more oxytocin receptors in that place. Some of the dark areas we expected from past studies, but others surprised us. It appears that these are areas that are unique to lemurs, which is pretty cool, I think. And next on the right, here's the brain of a non-monotonous black lemur. So this is the whole brain, not just one half of it, which is why it looks a little different. And in general, the locations of oxytocin receptors do look different from the monogamous red-bellied lemur. But what really surprised us is that these differences were actually seen across all species. There was a lot of variation even between individuals of the same species for that matter. We were expecting this really distinct split between monogamous and non-monogamous lemurs, but we actually didn't find it, which is the cool thing about science. You never really know what you're gonna find until you look. So what does this mean? Well, yes, brains are different between individuals and species, but it doesn't seem like we can predict where oxytocin receptors are going to just based off of the mating system of the species. This suggests that monogamy in lemurs might be more complicated than a simple difference in receptor locations. Basically, we need to keep looking. We need to keep exploring to find out more. And one way to do that is by changing how oxytocin works in the brain. But we only do non-invasive research at the Duke Lemur Center. We only do research that doesn't harm the animals. So we wanted to think about how we could achieve both of those goals at the same time. And luckily there is a medication developed for humans actually, so it's safe for humans to take even. And this medication blocks oxytocin receptors temporarily uh, after being given orally. Luckily it only lasts a few hours and everything goes back to normal afterwards. So if we give this antagonist that temporarily blocks the quote unquote cuddle hormone to lemurs, might it affect them differently depending on whether they're monogamous or not? And that's what we did. So we gave the blocker, which is what the little chemical you can see here on the left is, to 
pairs of monogamous and non-monogamous lemurs. So we gave it to the pairs together. And then we observed the behavior of the pairs in a couple of different situations. Some of the time we just watched them go about their day, but other times we wanted to see how they would react to a potential challenge to their mating bond. And for lemurs, one way to indicate the presence of a mating bond challenge is through the scent, the smell of a new lemur. So we presented lemurs with scents rubbed onto wooden dowels in something that we call a bioassay. Lemurs have been doing these bioassays for years as part of the research program at the Duke Lemur Center. I can tell you that the vast majority of the time, these lemurs are very enthusiastic participants. We wanted to know what would happen if we presented these scents of strangers to different lemurs. Would monogamous lemurs show the strongest responses since they're more bonded to partners and they see the scents as more of a threat? And secondarily, might this response be sort of changed or diminished by the oxytocin blocker that we gave to them? All right, so I want to give everyone a look at how this kind of goes on behind the scenes. So let's start with the process of getting lemurs to take the oxytocin receptor blocker. Again, the oxytocin receptor blocker isn't harmful, but it does taste bad like a lot of medicine. Imagine you had to chew and eat a pill instead of just being able to swallow it. Well, sometimes that's no problem for the lemurs, as Terry's demonstrates here, while he happily eats the blocker mixed in uh, with some treats. All right, way to go, Terry's. You'd never know there was a uh, medicine in there. Here is Terry's on another day. This time, he tastes the blocker, and you'll be able to see his reaction, but he powers through for that delicious banana. All right, so the, the head shaking back and forth, that's him, that's him tasting the, the medicine and trying to fling it out. And when that happens, we try to gather it back together and mix it in with some more banana and then feed it to him again. But sometimes the lemurs just aren't having it. So this is Persephone getting a big taste of the blocker and deciding she wants nothing to do with it. All right, I think you can actually almost hear her say nope there at the end. So yeah, we try to make the uh, medicine taste as good as possible and we give the lemurs a few attempts to eat it all. But again, all our research is non-invasive. The lemurs just absolutely refuse to take the blocker. We're not gonna force them. So in Persephone's case, she was stubborn enough that we just decided to not include her in our study, which is kind of how science goes sometimes. You gotta be able to adapt. And next, I wanted to show you what the bioassay looks like in action. So this is an older video, sorry for the quality. Uh, it's actually from someone who used to work in the same lab that I do. And you can see some of the lemurs different reactions here to the dowels that have different scents rubbed on them. All right, so you're gonna notice lots of sniffing, of course. And Tugger here will actually use a spur he has on his wrist to kind of score the dowel and then deposit his scent on the dowels directly. So he's kind of twisting his wrists around the dowels. That's what he's doing. He's using that spur on his wrist. He's mixing glands that he has on his chest onto his wrists and then putting them on these different dowels. You can see after he's done that to each of them, he says, okay, I'm, I'm done. My job here is done. 
So that's what our study did. We observed the lemurs, whether they're doing their own thing or being presented the bioassay during these different experimental conditions of either being given the drug or not. So this slide gives just a little taste of the results so far. We're still collecting data, so think of all of this as subject to change. But we uh, do find that when we just simply consider how much time pairs of lemurs spend apart, right? So here, taller bars mean they're spending more time apart. There is a difference that fits with what we expect. So on the left half of the graph, in the green box here, when you compare the green bar to all the others, it does look like Monogamous lemurs seem to spend more time apart when they receive an oxytocin blocker. But there isn't the same difference for the non-monogamous lemurs, which are on the right half of the graph within the orange box. What this suggests is that, as we expected, monogamous lemurs change their behavior more when given the blocker when compared to non-monogamous lemurs. As I said, uh, still lots more to look at, including the responses to the bioassay and things like that. But you know, this is kind of the kind of the kind of work that we can look at at the lemur center doing non-invasive research that still is able to get at the underlying biological and hormonal mechanisms enabling us to look under the skin so we can already conclude a few things though even though the the data are still being collected and first is that studying rare species like lemurs can teach us new things the biology of monogamy looks pretty different in lemurs compared to rodents. That's, that's something I'm pretty confident about and something that you know perhaps a lot of us might have suspected, but again, you'd never know until you look. And second, and related to the first point is, well, we need to study lemur love and bonding in order to better protect them, right? We want them to be able to reproduce. We want them to be able to increase their population sizes. And part of that is helping with their bonding and their reproduction in captivity in order to both increase population sizes and captivity in places like the Duke Lemur Center, but also to know what promotes their health and well-being in the wild. So this research, even though you know, it involves one hormone in a few different areas of the brain perhaps, has much broader implications for thinking about how we can best protect lemurs. Okay, that is all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for listening. And I have, I think, a lot of time for questions and I'm happy to uh, take them. Thank you so, so much for that awesome presentation. That was super informative. Um, now what we are going to do is I'm gonna pop around and invite each of the classes in one at a time to ask some questions. So first up is Madame Reader's class. You're gonna have to unmute your mic I know, there. I know, I'm unmuting. They're all telling me how to do it. Everybody one, two, three, say hi. Hi! All right, we have some really good questions here. Caden, come on up here and you can ask the first question. We loved your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so would male lemurs or female lemurs be more affected by the blocker than others or other way around? Or Ooh, that's a super good question. Yeah. Would males or females be more affected? So there are reasons to think that maybe female animals would be more affected. Um, some people, some, some scientists think that oxytocin um, goes to more places in the brain in female animals compared to male animals. And that's sort of because oxytocin is involved in things like giving birth and nursing, um, which males don't do. But our research so far suggests that it's important for both males and females. So we kind of wanted to see that. That was one of the like, you know, secondary questions we were interested in is if there would be differences between males and females. But yeah, good question. The short answer is we don't know. Awesome. Um, and I just wanted to point out anyone joining us from YouTube today, feel free to post in the chat questions and Nick will be able to answer those too. Um, now we're going to hear from Libby from um, Alabama. Um, hello. Um, I really liked your- Libby. I really liked your presentation, like a whole bunch. Um, so how did you get, how did you get into lemur research, if that makes sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Well, I got into lemur research uh, in a pretty roundabout or, or unusual way. I didn't study lemurs until a few years ago. I actually went to graduate school 
and I studied humans. I studied human romantic couples. Um, and in studying human romantic couples, that was how I got interested in hormones and in oxytocin. And then I finished graduate school. And, you know, I was really curious about how sort of widespread these ideas about oxytocin really were. It seemed like there was so much done on rodents and then you know, I was kind of working on humans. And so that area was expanding too, but I saw this like huge gap in between, right? What about all these non-human primates that, you know, biologically are different from us, but are also our close cousins and, and might be able to reveal some sort of secrets of behavior and nature that, that we wouldn't be able to find from just looking at rodents and humans. And so I um, then got in touch with people all around the country who worked with non-human primates. And uh, one of the places that got back to me was my current uh, boss at Duke University. And she was really keen to have me on to use sort of the skills I had developed working with human couples and, you know, doing research on hormones in the lab to a new model, uh, lemurs, which again, you know, are endangered animals. Uh, not a lot is known about them. So there was this real, real cool opportunity to you know, study things that really hadn't been looked at at all in lemurs before. Awesome. Um, next, we have Mr. Shaddix, grade six. Hi, I would like to know if the lemurs you have at the center, are they wild or bred in captivity? And also the tests you do on them, are they different than on lemurs bred in captivity or ones from the wild? Good questions. So, most of the lemurs at the lemur center are bred in captivity. Um, it typically is, is easier to have, you know, successful pairings and things like that if, if both animals are, are bred in captivity and were raised in captivity. Um, but some lemurs are so endangered that it's not an option to breed in captivity. You actually do have to go to Madagascar and bring over a couple of wild animals to basically increase the genetic diversity for creating more of these really endangered species. And as for uh, whether the procedures are done on animals raised in captivity or not, as far as I know, all of the animals that we did our studies on were animals that were either born at the Duke Lemur Center or born in other zoos or primate centers and then um, brought over. But again, no matter where they came from, you know, all the care for the animals was the same, they were housed together, and then all the procedures that we did with them were non-invasive and non-harmful. And as you saw from the video, if they don't want to participate, well, they don't participate. Very cool. Um, next is Miss Baraja's sixth grade class. So I have a couple questions. So I'll ask our first question and then if we have time for the next one. Um, one of the questions we got or I got from Victoria was, how do you know how old the lemurs are? How do you know their age? Well, good question. So if they were born in captivity, we have we have records, you know, it's it's kind of like people, we've got nice, well kept records of uh, where they were born, whether at the lemur center or in a different zoo. If they're from Madagascar, if they're one of those few animals that were brought over from the wild, it's uh, a lot trickier, right? So we can we can tell if they are adults or not just based off of their size and other aspects of their appearance. For instance, some lemurs are born one color, but then when they reach adulthood, they change to a different color. Um, so that's one way to know that they're at least, you know, say a couple of years old because most lemurs become adults somewhere around two and a half or three years old. Um, and then vets can use other features to try and estimate ages more precisely, things like looking at their teeth, uh, maybe measuring things like um, sort of, sort of genetic, um, sort of wear and tear, which you can do through something called telomeres. But for the most part, looking at their appearance is the best way to estimate ages. Though if they came from Madagascar, there's no way to know for sure. Awesome, now we have a question all the way from British Columbia and they're wondering what do lemurs eat? It depends on the lemur. That's a good question because it has a whole bunch of answers. Uh, yeah, so depending on the species of lemur, they might only eat fruit, they might only eat leaves, they might eat bugs or flowers or nectar, or they might eat all of them. So I'll just take a couple examples. Ring-tailed lemurs, you know, the most probably popular and common lemur, um, the ones with the black and white striped tail, they are omnivores. So they can pretty much eat anything. They can eat bugs, they can eat uh, flowers, they can eat leaves, they can eat fruit, and they seem to be pretty happy 
um, mixing and matching in a bunch of different ways. And let's see. Oh, well, I guess another example would be right behind me. Oh, I got to point to the right way. The, the lemur over my, <laughs> over my shoulder. I can't figure out how to point the right way with this camera. But the lemur in that picture over my shoulder, that's a collared lemur. And collared lemurs are frugivores, which means they eat lots of fruit, uh, sometimes nectar and, and things like that. Amazing. So we have time to uh, pop into all the classes again so you guys can ask another question. So Madame Reader's class, do you guys have another question? Yes, we do. Story, come stand up here. What's your question? Um, hi, Story. Hi. Um, nice what, age, what age do they find mates? Good question. What age do they find mates? So it depends if we're talking about, you know, in the wild or in captivity. And so let's, let's start with in captivity at the Duke Lemur Center. Uh, they become adults depending on the species, but on average about two and a half to three years old. And what folks at the lemur center typically do is once they get to that age and once they're, you know, separated from mom and they're kind of doing everything on their own and they, they become adults, what they'll do is they'll, they'll do kind of a trial run, right? They'll take the individual that's you know, a young adult and they'll introduce him or her to another individual, usually of the same age, but you can, you can mix and match the ages a little bit. And yeah, we'll do a trial run to see if they they get along with each other, to see if you know they uh, like spending time around each other, whether they'll groom each other, whether they share food nicely. And one of the tricky things about lemurs is that most of the time they're female dominant, which means that the females run the show, and they're actually um, can be pretty mean and aggressive if the males don't um, defer to her. So you know, especially with females, it's important that you find uh, pairings that that work so that they are getting along well with each other and that they have a good social bond, especially for monogamous species, right? That's kind of one of the, the points of all this is that the social bonds between mating partners are super important for monogamous species. And all that also feeds into the success of, you know, reproducing, making baby lemurs and, and making sure that the parents uh, work together sometimes to, to raise those lemurs successfully. So yeah, when they, when they become adults is really important. And, um, you know, we think that for the most part, they, they, you know, become adults and reproduce at around the same ages in Madagascar, but sometimes that can differ depending on um, the conditions in the environment for a given year. So at the lemur center, things are pretty consistent, right? They get, you know, always enough food. They always have the same shelter, um, you know, same, same mates, same social groups, things like that. But in the wild in Madagascar, things can vary a whole lot. You could have a really bad year where they say it's really dry. So there's not much food the next season or something like that. Or it could be that, you know, you happen to be in an area with not a lot of individuals from the same species around. So it's harder to find a mate. Um, so there's, I guess, a lot more variation in the wild than there is at the Duke Lemur Center. That was an awesome answer. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna head back to Libby. Um, hi again. I don't have any more questions, but I do want to say that all of your videos were super cute um, and funny, um, especially the ones, um, the birds that were dancing. I thought that that was so cute. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. I was, you know, making this presentation and I, I remembered that story about the birds and then that, you know, led me down a, a path of finding that video. And it's you know, that video goes on for like three minutes. They have a three minute long dance and they both, you know, they both know their part and they have this call and response language is really cool. Um, so it's kind of a really like spectacular, you know, fun example of, of monogamy in the wild and, and how it can look. And now back to Mr. Shaddix. Hi, I would like to know the oldest lemur you have and if there's like a specific lemur species that live long, lives longer than others. Yeah, good question. So how long do lemurs live? And again, it, it depends a lot on the species. Um, in general, the larger ones tend to live somewhat longer and uh, species that live at the Duke Lemur Center tend to be longer living. Uh, than ones in the wild since they've got, you know, stable diet and medical care and things like that. So I know that right now at the lemur center, there are a number of animals that are over 30 years old, which is pretty old for a lemur and, you know, not something you, you tend to see in the wild. Um, let's see, I think there's at least one that's over 35 years old. So pretty, pretty impressive uh, senior citizens in 
lemur world. And um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of variation. And one thing that's really cool, and maybe you guys can look it up afterwards, there was actually a story in the New York Times really recently about old lemurs at the Duke Lemur Center. And sometimes when they get really old, they might not have any other individuals of the same species to get paired with because we always keep the lemurs in pairs, never alone. And so what the lemur center will sometimes do with really old lemurs is they'll find two old individuals of different species and put them with each other. And so this is something that, you know, isn't typically done, but they need companions, right? Just like anyone else. And, you know, it turns out that the, the really geriatric, the really old lemurs uh, tend to do pretty well being paired with other geriatric lemurs, even if they're of different species. So that's a kind of cool example of how age seems to change, thing in the, change things in these lemurs. Yeah, that's super, super interesting. Um, we're gonna go back to Miss Baraja's class. They have a few questions for you. Okay, the first question is, how do you know, and this is like what your presentation was about, but how can you tell um, if some lemur species are monogamous or not? And is that, can you tell because you're studying the ones that you have there? Good question. And that's a really important question. Yeah. Um, so how do we know that certain species are monogamous? Well, you know, we, we rely on how they behave in the wild because at the lemur center, they're all, they're all um, housed together in pairs or in family groups. So, you know, in that way, they're all kind of pair living, but the difference is in the wild. Yeah. So these, these categorizations of monogamous or not monogamous come from observing them in the wild over long periods of time and several seasons, right? To see if, for instance, the same pair of animals work together over repeated seasons to, um, to raise offspring and, and to live together. And so what we know from, from watching these animals in the wild in their different parts of Madagascar is that, yeah, the mongoose lemurs and the red-bellied lemurs, those are the ones that live in pairs in the family groups and they have the biparental care and they seem pair bonded. Um, you know, you, you notice that from their interactions with one another, the way they groom each other and stay huddled together, things like that. And also monogamous species tend to be more territorial. Um, and so that's another thing you notice with the monogamous lemurs is that um, the red-bellied lemurs especially will scent mark everything, every possible piece of, you know, branch or, you know, um, floors or benches or, you know, whatever it is in the wild, anything that's around them including at the lemur center, they'll do it too. They'll mark it. And that's basically them saying, Hey, this is our territory. You know, um, me and my mate, we, we are controlling this area. This is where we're going to stay. And this is where we're going to raise our offspring. together." So you see these kind of like signature behaviors that uh, point towards monogamy being sort of the natural state of these species. And did you say you have another question? Oh, I'll bring them back in. Oh, sorry. So the other question was, what is the biggest threat to lemurs? A really important question. Let's see. Well, it's hard to pick just one, uh, but I think one of the largest, if not the largest, is um, habitat loss for the lemurs, right? So a lot of these lemurs aren't able to live in many different kinds of places. So some are really, you know, good generalists, like ring-tailed lemurs seem to be able to live in a lot of different places, but others are super, super specialized, which means they need a very specific kind of habitat to survive and to reproduce. And unfortunately, that habitat in Madagascar is, is disappearing too quickly, right? Things like climate change and deforestation are removing the kinds of places that these lemurs like to live in and tend to thrive and succeed in. So um, the fact that, you know, these lemurs aren't able to, to live where they want and to eat the kinds of things that they want means that they tend to be less successful in reproducing and in surviving in general. And that's one of the things that the Duke Lemur Center is really interested in is, you know, while trying to protect their wild habitats, if in captivity, we can sort of increase the genetic safety net, so to speak, right? Have larger and larger populations of captivity that if needed can be reintroduced into the wild to sort of uh, increase these population sizes and to maybe keep them going. So it kind of goes on both fronts, right? There's the captive breeding efforts at the Duke Lemur Center, and then there's the environmental preservation efforts that go on in Madagascar. Those two together are kind of the sort of key efforts to try and um, conserve these, these really cool, charismatic, interesting, interesting primates. 
That was a really awesome question and a great answer. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to go back to Mr. Shaddock's class. Mr. Shaddock's class. Hi there. So Nick, I think you uh, sort of touched on this, but with lemurs in the wild, if they're pair bonded and the mate dies, will they bond again with another lemur or will they live the rest of their life on their own? That's a really good question. And, you know, I'm actually not 100% sure, right? So you're kind of touching on um, something that I think a lot of people wonder if animals truly mate for life or if there really is a soulmate and just or just one for them and if, if their soulmate dies or moves on will they never love again or never find a mate again uh is that true for the parabon and lemurs i'm not entirely sure to to be honest i don't think that there's enough research on them to answer that question one way or the other you know as i mentioned they're endangered um, sometimes they're pretty hard to find even when you know where they are and you would have to follow them for years and years to see if after one of their mates dies, do they tend to find another one or do they stay on their own? If I had to guess, I would think that after a while they would go on and find a new mate, but I'm not sure. You know, we can't really answer that question at the Lemur Center because we'll introduce them to a new mate ourselves. We're kind of, you know, imposing that. But in the wild, it's not exactly clear how it works. Good question. Well, thank you, Nick, so much for that awesome presentation. Um, what I'm going to do is insert a link to the Duke Lemur Center. Um, so if you guys want to do any uh, extra research on this, um, you know where to go. And uh, I'm just going to pop everyone back in to say thank you, because that was amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.